In September of 1870, a group of lay people in Lincoln, Nebraska, founded a Universalist Society. Why were they Universalists? What did they believe? In the next few minutes, I'll try to summarize 2,000 years of Christian theology, identify the distinguishing beliefs of Universalists in America, and touch upon their major efforts <clears throat> and accomplishments. I've been allotted 10 minutes, so I'll get started. What happens when we die is a fundamental question. People reading the Bible at different times have come up with different answers. In England in the 18th century, the opinions of French theologian John Calvin held sway in the Church of England. He concluded that God predetermines or predestines those who will go to heaven. They are the elect. Everyone else is destined to hell and will suffer eternal damnation for their sins and bad luck. This interpretation was surprisingly popular in elite circles. But hellfire had its doubters and detractors. Why would a loving God and one worthy of respect treat his creation so poorly? John Wesley was an Anglican priest with his own reading of the Bible. In the 1830s, he began to preach in the open air, a new and more hopeful understanding of what happens when we die. Anyone who believed in Christ and repented of their sins would be saved. It was a great awakening of religious hope in England, and, the Wesley, and Wesley's teaching reached young John Murray, who was born in 1841. Already as a teen, Murray was a serious Anglican Calvinist and felt he was most probably among God's select. But he listened to John Wesley, he read the Bible for himself, and became a Methodist. Then he heard the preaching of John Relly, a Welsh Methodist minister with a vision of a design of a divine generosity even larger than John Wesley's, <laughs> the gift of universal salvation for all humanity. It was prepaid in full by Christ's sacrifice. <clears throat> there might be a period after death for retribution and repentance, but all would be forgiven and saved. Most Methodists considered this too good to be true. John Relly, John Murray, and their followers left the Methodists and their methods behind. John Murray had a positive, cheerful nature, and people were drawn to him. But death was no stranger in his early life. By the time he was 30 and had himself started preaching in southern England, four of his eight brothers and sisters had died, and his best friend had died, then his wife and son died. What happened when we die was a question that demanded an answer. John Murray thought he had the answer, but was still a bit depressed. <clears throat> he decided to sail across the sea and disappear into the wilderness of North America. The year was 1770. His ship ran aground in New Jersey. He went ashore to seek provisions. He met a man in the pine forest who had cleared land and built a religious meeting house, but had no regular preacher. John Murray gave it a try. And that was the beginning of universalism in America. A hundred years later, it reached Lincoln, Nebraska. In the same month of September 1870, 12,000 Universalists gathered for three days in Gloucester, Massachusetts, where John Murray had preached for almost two decades. It was considered the largest religious gathering in America up to that time. The message and hope of universal salvation had made it the sixth largest denomination in the country. With a careful reading of the Bible, common sense and kindliness, Universalists believed they had a good answer to what happens after death, that a loving God was ready to receive all who came his way. With a security in that promise, Universalists were freed to work to make this world a better place for the entire human family. In 1803, Universalists adopted the very short Win Winchester Profession of Faith, the third and final article of that profession stated, We believe that holiness and true happiness are inseparably connected, and that believers ought to be careful to maintain order and practice, and practice good works, for these things are good and profitable unto men. In other words, concern and action 
for reform of society in many areas became a focus for universalism, for living their faith. I will briefly talk about three concerns that continue to this day. Capital punishment, the equality of women, and the, the abolition of slavery and its evil legacy. From the early in the 19th century, Unitarians supported prison reform and opposed capital punishment. One observer from the era said, Universalists unquestionably provided more anti-gallows reformers than any other denomination. There was even some success. By 1856, three states had eliminated the death penalty, Michigan, Rhode Island, and Wisconsin. Capital punishment was seen by Universalists as against their fundamental beliefs. Quote, For if God's punishments were remedial and reformative in their nature, so likewise should be the punishments inflicted by man upon his fellow man. Equal rights for women were important to Universalists from the earliest days. Judith Sargent Murray, an essayist and, an essayist and playwright, and the second wife of John Murray, made a very clear statement in 1798. Our evidences tend to prove women alike capable and of enduring hardships, equally ingenious and in fruitful in resources. Their fortitude and heroism cannot be surpassed. They are equally brave. They are as patriotic, influential, and energetic, and as eloquent, as faithful, and as persevering in their attachments, as capable of supporting with honor the toils of government, and equally susceptible of every literary acquirement. So said Judith Sargent Murray. Non-separate and equal educational opportunities were made open to women by universalist schools. Every one of the academies, seminaries, and colleges established by universalists were co-educational from day one, with the exception of Tuss, Tufts College, not until the 19, 19, 1890s. Lombard College in Galesburg, Illinois, was the second college in America to admit women from the beginning in 1853. Oberlin in Ohio was the first in 1837. <clears throat> Equal opportunity for women in universalist ministry became a reality in 1863 when Olympia Brown became the first woman to be ordained with full denominational authority. In the same year, Augusta Jane Chapman was also ordained. By 1870, 15 women had preached in Universalist churches and five were fully ordained. Several of these women lived long enough to see women's right to vote finally enacted in 1920. Women's suffrage was a continuing un Universalist cause throughout the 19th century. Slavery became the greatest moral and political issue in the 19th century, in 19th century America. Universalists were initially slow to get involved. There was a belief that slavery was a political issue and should not be discussed in church. Some Southern Unitarians, argue, Universalists, argued that it was an institution actually helpful to the Negro. By 1838, the American Anti-Slavery Association started by abolitionist William Lloyd Garrison, had 1,350 chapters throughout the states and about 250,000 members. A bit standoffish, Universalists started their own Universalist anti-slavery convention. In its second year, in 1841, 32 people attended. But change came quickly to the denomination. In 1843, that's only two years after, 1841, at the Universalist General Convention in Akron, Ohio, a strong anti-slavery resolution passed 49 to 1. In part, it clearly stated, the holding in bondage of our brethren for whom Christ died, or the treatment of any human being with obloquy, harshness, or any indignity on account of his color or race was contrary to righteousness, inconsistent with Christianity, and especially with the doctrine of universal grace and love, which we cherish as the most important of revealed truth. Universalists thereby 
became the first denomination in the United States to officially oppose slavery. When the war came, Universalists showed up. The first Union soldier to die was a Universalist. They served in the front lines and in the hospitals, and after the war, Universalists helped staff the Freedmen's Bureau in the South to help the freed slaves. Unitarians could see the long road ahead for real freedom and equal rights. As E.G. Brooks told the Universalist Reform Association in 1853, the indignities and oppressions so wickedly heaped upon the men of color, whether slave or free, had to be removed. Free Americans must see not only to the emancipation of the black man, but providing him an opportunity to develop self-respect, hastening the overthrow of caste, annulling social exclusiveness, and opening the way for him to take his stand as the equal and brother of the noblest. John Greenleaf Adams, speaking to the Universalist Rhode Island Convention in 1864, stated that beyond emancipation, we must conquer our miserable prejudices. It's a battle that continues to this day. <clears throat> I must now end this brief survey of universalist belief and action with a return to Lincoln, Nebraska in 1870. I think that it is fair to say that they, our ancestors, believed in a universe guided by a God of love who wished the best for humanity, his creation. With the security of that belief, the Universal, Universalist Society of Lincoln already had a great heritage and experience to continue the struggle for human progress and justice on this earth. <clears throat>